Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Reimagine 2021 V7 History of Coins. This is our seventh conference. I'm Roshan Maroshkar, one of your hosts for this event. I'm also the project manager of the Reimagine 2021 conference series. And uh, you see, I got my Mario hat on. Uh, the theme for this con uh, conference is video games slash Mario. We're looking at the history of uh, crypto and also getting thoughts on, on the future of it as well. Uh, enough about me. With me here today, I have Michael Anderson, who is one of the co-founders of uh, Framework Ventures. Michael, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, how has the last couple of months been for you and your team? Um, and then we can go into some deep dives about how you got into the space and uh, what you're actually working on now. Well, thank you for having me. First off, um, the the last few months have been uh, very exciting to say the least. I mean, what we see in sort of the global macro world, uh, you know, as we hopefully have light at the end of the tunnel of COVID, um, Bitcoin being on the rise, being the the primary choice of uh, reserve asset that corporates, insurance companies, uh, large macro hedge funds are allocating as an inflation protected asset. I think that that's creating a lot of attention around the space, and and um, you know one of the spaces within the space that we focus on is DeFi. Um, that is also getting a lot of attention, just with the uh, ability of these protocols to disintermediate traditional finance applications. I, I think we're starting to see some of that work itself out. Yeah, for sure. There's been a lot of movements in the past couple of months. So to start off with, uh, I want to let everyone know, you know, kind of tell your story a bit about how you first got introduced uh, into crypto, uh, and then we can lead up to the exciting stuff that you're working on right now, uh, making impact in a lot of these projects. Sure. Yeah. So um, I first got introduced to, to crypto uh, in college. Um, it, it's kind of one of the, the classic stories of um, I was studying economics and computer science. Uh, a friend told me about this thing called Bitcoin. We started mining Bitcoin uh, a bit in our in our dorm room in 2012. Um, but I, I never really kind of saw the potential of Bitcoin itself. Um, I'd say that has changed fundamentally, but um, where I started to really fall down the rabbit hole was with Ethereum in 2014 um, and reading the, the, um, the white paper, understanding um, when you can actually add business logic and programmability to value transfer, the primitives that can come out of that are really fundamental and powerful. Um, it's taken us you know, at this point seven years for that realization to, to kind of come to the forefront. Um, but what we're seeing now in DeFi is, is nothing short of uh, fundamental in terms of the world of finance. And um, you know, to go back to my story a bit, um, I was working in traditional consumer technology. I, I was a product manager at Dropbox and then Snapchat. Um, <clears throat> I met my co-founder uh, when we were living together in Los Angeles. Um, and our story uh, kind of started professionally with uh, us starting a company called Hashleets. Uh, which was kind of the precursor to what is now uh, Top Shot. Uh, we were building digital collectibles for, for professional athletes, um, and we were building them specifically for NFL football players. Um, so we, we had a, a lot of experience in the non-fungible token space in 2017 and 2018, um, ended up selling the business. But where we uh, netted out is um, what we recognized in the space and, and where why we started Framework was because we, we saw that traditional venture capitalists were not really kind of meeting the needs of what an open network and a, and a protocol token really, really needed to bootstrap growth and engagement. Um, so we started Framework to go off and, and solve that problem. Got it. Yeah, that's actually pretty interesting. Not everyone starts off with learning about it in college. I mean, certainly there's a lot of students uh, listening in uh, as well who have all started student clubs and different things like that. Uh, but yeah, that's really cool. I think the NBA project that you're talking about uh, is pretty popular right now in the past couple of weeks, um, as I've seen. So how would you say your perception over time just being the space, uh, you know, what do you think the role of crypto, how do you think it's changed? And uh, what do you think is still the toughest part for uh, new people entering the space in terms of understanding the differences between uh, some of the assets that you mentioned? Yeah, so um, I think Naval Ravikant said it really well. Um, crypto and, and crypto assets are kind of like a you know 400 or 500 level graduate course with prerequisites in economics, computer science, distributed systems, organizational theory. And if you're missing one of those preliminary components, you're not going to fully understand how all this stuff fits together. 
Um, so I think it's it's really just, it, it takes a huge learning curve to get off the ground. Um, but the way that I would say my, my understanding or kind of thoughts around crypto has changed is um, when I was working at Dropbox and Snapchat, I was building financial technology products. So payments, commerce, and billing. And what I saw is just the fundamentally antiquated nature of how uh, financial technology is built. You know, there is uh, essentially no change in the infrastructure stack of financial companies or financial institutions over the last 40 years. And for the first time ever, we now have blockchain technology and, and decentralized finance uh, is, is you know, the outcome of that uh, because it's going to be able to disintermediate financial firms. Um, Bitcoin, I think, is maybe kind of the first killer application of blockchain technology. But just like email wasn't the end-all be-all for the internet, I think that we're going to find that you know, the internet and, and in this case, blockchains have a lot more potential. Yeah, great to hear from your actual perspective of uh, working at some of these companies and, and seeing how I think change is a little slower at some of these companies. And obviously in the open world of, of crypto, when you have things like Ethereum and other open source technology or even oracles can kind of get into that a little bit later here. I, I just think the... Uh, the, the, the rapid uh, the rapidness of the of, of the change like how fast things evolve are, are just faster and there's no barriers right there's no circuit breakers or or anything like that so I think it can be good or bad um, yeah, totally. yeah so talk to me a little now about framework ventures right uh, you know what is framework with ventures exactly and go into a little bit about your exact philosophy and, and ideals because I do think it's very different than what we traditionally see. And I want every, all of our viewers to get a, a good idea of also why you're doing this, right? Uh, why you're so focused on, on, on DeFi and some of the exciting things there. Absolutely. So Framework is actually two kind of entities. Um, there's Framework Ventures on one side, which is our venture funds. Um, and, and that's where we make principal investments out of Framework Labs is kind of the hub of, uh, you know, in the world, world of uh, venture firms, it's, it's our management company, but it's, it's very different. You know, we are a technology company at our core. Um, we have a number of engineers and product managers who are building alongside the investments and the protocols that we, that we invest in. Um, because, you know, when uh, we were starting Framework and I mentioned, you know, this, this idea of feeling like there was a gap in the market for venture uh, investing in this space, um, we felt like venture capitalists were just kind of buying and holding. They weren't participating with their tokens. You know, technology companies were building services on top of these protocols and, and hedge funds were trading these assets like they're tradable assets. Um, but there wasn't anyone who was doing all three. And so all three of them combined together into what we call network capital. Um, and really what that means is that, you know, it's a different style of investing because it's not venture, it's not hedge funds, it's not private equity. Uh, we take a venture approach, so multi-year horizon for any investment that we make. Um, so that's similar to venture, but we're buying tokens. We're not buying equity. You know, we're Lat Framework Labs also becomes one of the largest customers or users of the protocols that we invest in, um, and we build software to to help you know bootstrap engagement and activity. Uh, and so what that turns into is you know we're we're usually one of the larger investors in the projects that we invest in. Uh, but that means that we can also kind of come to the founding, founding team and say, here's all the, all the myriad ways that we can actually help just post, you know, investment um, that, that I think is differentiated. Got it. So it's not just about the funds. I, I really love that because I think a lot of the VC world and the perception that people have of it is it's just about the funds or, uh, you know, not enough people that have uh, access to the fund. So, uh, you know, it's interesting that you you know, you all chose specifically um, uh, to focus on, on on DeFi. That's kind of your uh, specialty. So why did you act, all, all actually choose to focus on DeFi in 2020? And it was quite a rocky year. There was a lot of uh, ups and downs. So what was it that really uh, led, you, uh, led you and your firm to this uh, great success? Like, how did you get through it? And what was kind of your thinking back then and is it sort of still the same in terms of just looking at, at DeFi? So um, the first thing I'll say is we, we uh, started Framework without, you know, a singular focus on DeFi. We, we started Framework, you know, we came from the world of NFTs and, and Web3. Um, so we had a ton of experience going through that uh, Hashleys experience. 
And when we started Framework, one of the things that we very quickly realized, you know, in August, I think, of 2019, is that the, the real power of um, decentralized finance applications highlight the technology of blockchains. You know, blockchains are purpose built for, for value transfer. And when um, you, know, you don't have real wallet technology that's consumer viable, when you don't have kind of the canonical digital display case that is required for NFTs um, to be a consumer application, when, when you have you know, all of this value that sits on chain and the transaction throughput isn't very high to, to the point where you can actually run a consumer app on Ethereum, the only thing that really made sense was financial technology applications because you have low transaction throughput, but high value per transaction. And, and so that just kind of clicked for us. Um, and so that's what led us in the direction of DeFi. Um, but then as we started to dig in further, uh, we, we just decided to have our first fund uh, that we started in 2019 to, to almost solely focus on DeFi. It was the only thing that made sense from a product market fit perspective. Um, and then as we started to make individual investments, um, we just started to see the, the, the proof that it was working. Um, so we decided to, to go double down uh, in 2020. But you know, for us now, I think the perspective is changing. Uh, NFTs are working, and you know, Top Shot is a great example of this. Uh, CryptoPunks is a great example of this. You know, they're definitely benefiting from the crypto wealth effect that's happened over the last six months. But I think there is something real to that, and and I think we're starting to see the the data to suggest that that's correct. And so, looking forward, I think you know, Framework has definitely hung its hung its hat on DeFi as kind of the thing that we focus on. Um, but, you know, again, we came from the NFT world. And, and so going forward, we're going to have a, a pretty strong focus on NFTs and, and kind of the other myriad things that could be uh, coming out of blockchains as well. Got it. Okay. That's actually pretty interesting to know that um, your, your core competencies are not just DeFi. Like it's sort of the same realm, but um, you all are, are going to be uh, expanding or have experience already in those spaces. And these are all uh, rapidly growing spaces. And to give people some perspective, so when you experience something like the bull run and you have prices going up, how does it affect um, someone like fr uh, Framework? Um, do you guys sort of, you know, double down on the existing chains or do you al always look for, let's say, new, uh, new chains launching? Or I'm trying to get a sense of last year, you know, we had tons of uh, yield farming apps just launching very quickly and it wasn't even fast enough for consumers to even bet a lot of these things. So when these changes in the markets happen, I guess, what are the top three levers, so to speak, that, that you look for um, when evaluating something like a DeFi prod product? Um, is it more about, I guess, uh, transactions and all, and all of that is always important, uh, but do you look at things like in which countries are uh, using specific DeFi projects or, or anything like that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I mentioned our, our strategy is a venture thesis for all of our investments. And, and what this means is we want to buy, you know, a, a sizable enough uh, of the network, uh, chunk of tokens, whatever it may be, um, so to have a meaningful stake. But then we also take at least a five-year perspective on any investment that we make. And so, um, with that, we have yet to sell a single one of our tokens um, from our from our first fund. Um, you know, we're not in the business of trading. Uh, we're we're definitely investors. But one of the things that I think is definitely unique uh, about this space is that you can see all of this information on chain. Um, and so, Framework Labs for us helps evaluate from a software perspective. You know, what's the activity looking like? What's the engagement looking like? Um, how are people using this? Are, is it repeat customers? Is it, you know, is all the volume of a decentralized exchange three different wallets or is it diversified and it's a bunch of users coming together to use this? And, and so you can see all of that in real time and you can track it and that definitely helps build insight. But it, it, a lot of that is, is post investment for us because when we're investing, it's before there's a token, it's before there's a network, before there's even a product. Um, we're really backing a team. And, and so, you know, our investment criteria First and foremost comes down to the founding team. You know, are they world class? And one of the most exciting things from our perspective that we've seen in the last six months is the quality of founders has substantially gone up because people are recognizing that this has the potential to be a real new substrate to to be creative and and be an entrepreneur. And so, you know, that quality is is a really huge strong signal for us. Um, the second I'd say is just what's the product 
and what's the market? You know, are they doing something differentiated? Is it something that's going to be well, well received in the market, or is it something that's just sort of a novel, not novel, and and just kind of a tweak on something that's already existing? So that's number two. Number three for us is community, and this may be a bit non-obvious, but when we're talking about open source projects, the interface to your customers, the interface to your partners, the interface to for customer support, whatever it may be, is your community. And if you have a high quality community, that's something that's not forkable, hackable, stealable, anything. You know, liquidity is something that moves around. All the code is on chain, so there's no IP in that. Um, but if you have a defensible community of participants and contributors, that's something that has true staying power. So that's that's probably a non-obvious one that we really go deep on and, and we use to evaluate any investment that we make. Yeah, I love how you actually mentioned community because I think again, with the uh, with, with the perspective of, of VCs, a lot of people, I think don't fully understand the role of VCs and uh, they also think that uh, the barriers to entry are very high. And I think they would generally be correct. But now I kind of want to segue into getting your thoughts about what do you think the is the role of VCs uh, specifically in DeFi, right? We're talking about like a decentralized platform um, and we're also talking about uh, people like you and, uh, you and your team who you need someone to foster uh, a lot of those things. Can you kind of talk about some uh, benefits and what are some things that you see traditional VCs just not able to do, right? And you already mentioned some of them, but uh, I want to get into some, like, some, some, uh, some cool use cases and some, some real uh, uh, competitive advantages, basically, uh, of structuring sure. your fund in this way, right? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. It becomes our, our unfair advantage. Framework Labs is our unfair advantage. Um, you know, we, we are structured differently, which enables us to operate in, in ways that Andreessen Horowitz can't. Um, it enables us, you know, to participate in governance. It enables us to stake these assets. You know, we're the largest staker of the graph and synthetics. I think we're one of the largest stakers of Aave. You know, if, if you can stake the token, we will absolutely do that. Um, we help with governance. So we, you know, as community members and as stewards of the investment who have a very long-term perspective of anything that we buy, you know, we are, we're in it for the long run. And, you know, we're, we're not going to sell something just because it's not doing well, even if there's a liquid market for it, because you know, there's always the potential for it to turn around. Um, and so when it comes to governance, we'll, we'll do things like change the monetary policy. We'll actually build features that go into the protocol itself. So we're, we're not just kind of passive token holders that are voting or staking, we're also, you know, developers that are building. Um, and we've got a team of people who are doing so. And, and that I think, you know, helps us align really well with the core team. Um, but it also helps provide, uh, you know, just different perspectives because we see a lot of other things, whereas a team who's focused on one protocol or one network is going to be focused on that one thing. And so we can help kind of survey the scene and survey what's going on around with other projects and hopefully provide good insight there. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things that we do. Um, but, you know, from a technical perspective, um, I, I do think having a software focus is a differentiated approach when you're a venture firm. Yeah, for sure. And most of DeFi um, is software. But again, going back to those uh, community members, you definitely need people uh, to to drive the, the usage and also understand how a lot of these uh, applications work. So uh, looking at the, the future of DeFi, do you see a lot of money coming from traditional finance into DeFi unironically, or do you think it's still going to be this sort of retail driven market uh, where normal people are finding out how uh, traditional finance really you know, doesn't really pay the bill, so to speak. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the quick answer is both. Um, we have a number, of, we've especially recently had a number of conversations with massive financial institutions who are just looking to get access to this. And, and it's still really, really hard to get access to it. We may be really used to using ledgers and MetaMask, et cetera, but 
of someone who is, you know, a $5 billion hedge fund that wants to put a hundred million dollars into, into curve as stable coins. That's not something that is really feasible for them right now. You know, you've got custody risks, you've got ins no, no insurance, you've got, you know, actual uh, technology risks where, you know, these, these things could still get hacked or, or have a vulnerability. Um, and so there's still a lot of risk. And I think as we de-risk the situation, we're going to start to see a lot more financial institutions get on board. Um, but the real kind of users that I think are going to make up the bulk of the usage of DeFi is, is retail. Uh, I think DeFi is, you know, it's in the name right there, decentralized finance, democratized finance. Um, and when I think about the future of finance, I think of it being democratized, open and transparent, but also community owned and community governed. So, you know, it, it may be someone who owns a bunch of um, synthetics tokens, who's a major uh, financial institution, who's voting on these different proposals, but it may also just be an early adopter who has the equivalent number of synthetics tokens because they were early but they're now you know, just as equal footing with those financial institutions. And so I think we have to think about this in the future as being equal and open for financial institutions to come in and participate, but also for retail to come and participate in, in an equivalent way. Um, and so I think that's, that's what really gets us excited is thinking about this, that being the, the future of finance um, where everybody has a seat at the table. Yeah, for sure. It certainly does create a more level playing field than you know, uh, a lot of these early startups or early technology that really retail users, unless you're a super, super early adopter or something like crypto, uh, where it was a bunch of just more technical people that got exposed to it, uh, you're gonna miss the boat on, on a lot of those things. Um, I wanna ask you an interesting question. What a, what's an interesting application of DeFi that you think is super cool, but it's not super practical? Like one of my questions would be, um, right now, do you think it's practical and is it possible for, you know, for kind of from a VC or an investing standpoint for, let's say, angel investors and, and different types of investors to actually invest in other startups um, using something like stable coins or maybe it is Bitcoin or Ethereum? Or do you just think that's something uh, cool, but, but not viable, like I mentioned? Well, I, I think stable coins are every single day finding more use cases. Um, we, uh, we view stable coins as being kind of the bedrock of what, you know, the, the equivalent food pyramid of, of DeFi and, and it's, it's the base layer, it's the bedrock. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, you can start funding and paying for things with a credit card using USDC. Um, I think that that would definitely happen. So, you know, one of the benefits of being in this industry that's evolving so rapidly and, and is open source by, by default is that you know nothing is far afield in terms of what's possible? Um, I think that you know I would I'd be hard pressed to say anything won't work out because anything can work out just in the way that it's moving so far. Um, and and who knows? You know I I've always thought you know synthetic uh, representations of non financialized markets is a really really interesting product. Um, you know one example here could be like a synthetic representation of the NFL power rankings of, on ESPN or it could be you know Spotify plays and you're essentially betting on the marketplaces of who's the most popular artist finding them when they're early with low numbers of monthly listens and then you know benefiting from your your follow uh, and your kind of fanship over the course of their trajectory uh, you know that's a really interesting product that I haven't seen done yet um, also may not have a market for it, but, but that may be one example that, um, I think is cool, but you know, remains to be seen how it'll work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think you're also touching a lot of, uh, ideas about just tokenizing the world as they said a couple of years ago. And some of those things are actually coming, um, true and they are finding real value such as NBA top shop, NBA top shot and, uh, different other projects like that, at least, uh, yeah, you can actually collect. Uh, commercial value or, or whatever it is. Uh, interesting, an interesting thing that you just brought up about open source technology. I want to get into this a little bit here because I think in the in traditional finance or traditional investing, um, a, a, a lot of investors really look for those, uh, for, look for acquiring intellectual property um, or a specific competitive advantage like buying uh, by buying a company with a large market share, right? These are all traditional paradigms. Do you think it's different from your perspective um, um, 
being a VC firm in a in a decentralized market, right? So do you actually like would you value the intellectual property of some piece of technology? Or do you think that um, since DeFi has such an open nature and there's not really a lot of value there, or maybe there is, I'm not sure what your perspective is, but I'm trying to uh, ask you a question about that in terms of what do you value more um, and how, how do you see it as, as different, right? So if, if you're a traditional venture capitalist um, who's trying to uh, break into blockchain assets, you basically have to take every single thing that you previously did and rethink the entire model from the ground up. Um, you know, it, where you previously had uh, intellectual property kind of building this value in a corporate equity state, uh, having shares be the coordination mechanism um, and thinking about things built from the ground up, uh, you now have to think about things as composable open source projects where you're leveraging as much as you possibly can from other projects. And, you know, the power in this is really powerful. You know, the, the Uniswap example, I think is a great one. They do one to $2 billion of volume a day. They have nine employees. Coinbase has hundreds of employees and they do the same amount of volume every day. And, you know, that's just the difference between a company who has to build everything full stack up versus Uniswap, who's leveraging Ethereum, they're leveraging the aggregators like one inch who are, who are pumping volume through them. You know, they're leveraging synthetics with their synthetic tokens. You know, all of this stuff kind of interrelates as a, as a full tech stack. And so, you know, when we think about moats, the things that you previously thought were, were really valuable is, you know, market share, customer relationships, your IP, your technology, like all of that stuff is gone. You now have open source composable projects where technology can be something that builds your brand and builds your, your reputation and therefore kind of the connections and the distribution that you have. But really, it's, it comes back to um, community. And if you have you know, the connections with the community to have the contributors want to be contributing, to have the, the participants, you know, the liquidity providers, the traders, who, whomever it may be, you know, the reason why they put it into Uniswap is because they view Uniswap as being a great place to make money, but it's also a safe place. It's also kind of uh, a well-trafficked uh, place. So the liquidity providers will earn their returns better on Uniswap than they would other AMMs. And so that, that positive feedback cycle just continues where when you have multi-sided marketplace and they're incentivized to continue to, to bring others in, you know, that, that is the true network effect. And, and so network effects in the blockchain world are, are just fundamentally different than network effects in the, in the non-blockchain world. Yeah, that was a great example, actually, uh, comparing Coinbase to Uniswap, that, that's very true. The, the, I, I would say the input on number of resources you have doesn't always equal the amount of output um, in, in, in this uh, untrad untraditional uh, finance world, DeFi. Um, well yeah, go ahead. Uh, well said, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were saying something. Um, what I, yeah, the other the other thing I wanted to get into too, since we're you know uh, talking about VCs a lot, but also you know uh, touching the important points about uh, what what make the market fundamentals basically. Um, from the VC perspective, what do you think? Like, are you bullish about uh, things like yield farming and the concept of let's say govern governance? Right? Does that actually affect? how you look at an investment. Like I'm talking about um, how a lot of people out there, right, when they're lending their money, they sometimes become uh, LPs, I would say, in some of these uh, network protocols, I guess, similar to yourself as well. But what I'm trying to ask is, um, what do you, how do you sort of keep your competitive edge or what are those key ideas that you're thinking about? Well, also knowing that this market is sort of open to anyone, like anyone could be a mini LP uh, so to speak, and uh, kind of bouncing off what you said about transparency earlier. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think you know the, the way that we keep our edge is just is just sharpening our edge every day, um, having a day one mentality, but also just staying connected with every single thing that's happening, um, and talking to the founders, talking to the potential founders, talking to the people working at these companies or, or projects, um, and so I, I think that's you know kind of how we derive our edge. The, the fact of, you know, there being yield farming and is it sustainable and, and uh, I, I think absolutely what we've unlocked is two things. One, community ownership and community governance, you know, where you're actually giving 
the ownership and, and governance rights to the community members, to the users. It would be like if you got a share of Uber every time you took an Uber ride, and if you were a driver, you got two shares of Uber every time you gave a ride. Uh, and, and at that point, you're turning over kind of the, the value accrual, but you're also turning over the governance of the, the Uber platform to those participants, those users. And, and so that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is, is the token design space is a blank canvas. You know, the, the fact that it's just software and it runs on a distributed computer is a, a, a like the, the ninth wonder of the world, I think, because what we now have is the ability to have any creative person come up with any idea that aligns incentives better than what we have in the traditional world. But the cycle times of us trying different models is you know days or weeks, whereas in, in the traditional world, it's decades. And, and so you know what we've seen with the advent of corporate America, corporations as the kind of entity that we, we structure products around uh, and, and that build products and release them to customers, I think that is something that has worked in the past, but we're really putting it to the test now with uh, you know the fact that we can have people live anywhere who are working on projects together. They can have customers from anywhere because it's an open system and open protocols. And, and they can kind of align incentives perfectly across all of those participants because they have this thing called a token, which is like a little snowflake flight for each of the different networks. Um, and so, so that I think is, is kind of, how we look at what a token is and, and how, you know, when we're evaluating things, how we think we can derive edge, but as we're investing with a project, how we can hopefully guide them to help def defend their position and, and kind of have that moat. Um, you know, the incentives and the alignment there is, is really kind of the crucial thing. Yeah, got it for sure. I, I would say different, uh, different chains or different projects uh, some of them have governance features and, and I guess some of them don't, and that would kind of, uh, go uh, that would kind of match as to what the specific uh, goal of the project was. Um, I know you've been involved in crypto uh, for quite some time. So how, how would you say the uh, either the governance or the tokenomics uh, distribution or the incentives, how have they changed since the uh, ICO boom that a, a lot of us uh, lived through where things were just structured very, very differently. I feel like they were just structured based on uh, high distribution, but now you're telling me that, you know, you, you think that long-term people are actually going to uh, use and, and cast their votes on these projects in addition to the uh, monetary benefit. Yeah, so, I mean, 2017 was all about capital formation. Uh, and, and I think what you have when you have speculative mania around capital formation is you have fraud. Uh, and so 2017 really was a, a year of a lot of issues in terms of, you know, running up against SEC regulations and, you know, un, unclear as to what the product and the market was actually going to be. And, and whenever you have capital formation first, product development second, like th that's just a real big conflict. Um, and so we've gotten wiser, we've gotten better and we've matured as an industry. Um, and so now capital formation happens on the private side mostly, then you have the distribution event or the, kind of the launch of the token, um, and then you start turning over progressively the governance to the community and, and to the participants. And, and so I think, you know, that just aligns incentives better. It, it I think, helps uh, put us on the right side of regulatory history where, you know, we're actually working to improve and actually opening up the potential for regulators to come in and see everything, you know, on chain. Um, you know, one thing that we like to think about is the role of a financial regulator in the future isn't going to be financial oversight. It's going to be code review. Uh, and, and that's really kind of how they, I think, will have to operate in this world. Um, and it'll be better for them because they'll be able to see it in real time and in at any time. Um, and, and so I, I think comparing this to 2017, we just have so much more staying power now um, and, and, you know, maybe you call it the Lindy effect, but it, it's really something that, you know, doesn't run afoul, afoul of regulators. It provides a better incentive structure to maintain the staying power. Um, and it's just not going as quickly as 2017 was. We're now in year three of DeFi uh, and, and it, it still is, is just starting. Um, whereas 2017 felt like more of a flash in the pan. Yep, and I and I yeah, a lot of people weren't really talking about the the DeFi term back then. It was more about um, ICOs, but people had similar concepts, and I think you're definitely correct that they just weren't thought out fully through and sort of had that cleansing period 
Um, and then since then, since that bear market, a lot of projects have been actually building, uh, you know, important things. Uh, I was talking to a couple uh, of uh, other interview guests too, and they're also talking about their experience with um, uh, NFTs and like creating more content. So I definitely think that's a uh, positive thing for our industry as a whole, because it sort of gets new people in. Um, to kind of wrap things up, I want to ask you a few, a uh, couple last questions about the, the future trends of the space. But first, I just want to zoom out again. And uh, I just want to hear you talk about, you know, why is it so important to you um, that the real world, uh, why, sorry, why is it so important to you uh, uh, that DeFi is used in, in the real world? Um, do you have a couple of ideas or, or philosophies about, you know, is, is it more so contrasting with the current problems that are occurring day by day in traditional financial infrastructure? Or are you more of a technologist who, uh, you know, believes these traditional payment rails just aren't evolving um, as fast? Uh, my answer to that would be both. Uh, and they're happening simultaneously. We have, um, you know, now we have the developer sandbox to create new financial products. Um, and, and having that is a, a massive tool in and of itself. Um, so we have all of the capabilities to do this, but you're also looking at, you know, the things that are happening on our global perspective, you know, you, you kind of have uh, untrust in the government uh, in, in terms of just monetary policy, central banking, uh, you have untrust in, in corporations, um, you know, the, the running uh, up against the Googles and the Facebooks of the world based on data and data rights and, and kind of um, privacy, I think is a big deal. Uh, and so, you know, you're seeing this pendulum swing from full centralization, and now it's moving over to decentralization in, in a number of non-technical arenas. And, and so having the tools to be able to go off and build decentralized finance, having the, the, the kind of the strong um, uh, tailwind of decentralization and an and urge for more decentralization, um, and, and just the timing of kind of everything coalescing, frankly, around COVID, uh, that spun things up multiple years. I mean, this this trajectory, I think, you know, what, what has happened in the last 10 months probably was going to happen in the next 10 years had COVID not happened. And, and so now we just kind of have a speeding up of the process. Um, and, and I think that is also garnering a ton of human capital attention, financial capital attention, uh, and, and just, you know, uh, news and, and attention in general. Um, and so with all of that coalescing at the same time, I think that you know, is kind of why, uh, why we're so excited, but, but that's kind of where it's going as well. Yeah, well said. And to finally wrap things up, I want to ask you one last question. What do you think in 2021 will be like, what will be the number one thing that, that you think DeFi will uh, disrupt next this year? <laughs> um, really good question. So I, I think we're, we're kind of picking off different financial primitives and going off and, and uh, disintermediating them from, from centralized crypto and, and you know, exchange, you have derivatives, um, you've got lending, you've got borrowing, you've got all these kind of core thoughts, core, core primitives. I think the next one truly is gonna be options. Um, and that is you know, one of the predominant trading mechanisms in traditional finance. You, you have Deribit and centralized crypto finance as a massive player in this. You just don't have any real kind of option, decentralized options platforms that have hit massive scale yet. Um, so I think we'll look back on 2021 and say, okay, options was was that. Um, but but I also think there's a you know one of the maybe um, counterintuitive trends that I think we're going to see at the end of 21 as well is you know the number one reserve asset in crypto uh, in DeFi will be Bitcoin. Um, you know we're going to start to see Bitcoin and all the different variants of Bitcoin. Um, displace Ethereum, displace stable coins as the primary kind of collateral choice. Um, and so as soon as that happens, I, I think we're going to see DeFi do another 10x. Yeah, that's a great way to end things off. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? I've never heard someone say that. So that is uh, an awesome thought. Michael, thank you so much for joining us here today at Reimagine 2020 uh, V7. And I encourage everyone to check out uh, Framework uh, Ventures and Framework Labs. It's really interesting. Uh, the thesis that you guys all have. Uh, and thank you for sharing your thoughts here today. Uh, I'll let you all tune back in to Reimagine 2021 V7.